Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Inochi working for Seoul National University Hospital. And my co-chair is uh, Youngjin Choi, uh, working for Bucheon Sejong Hospital. I'm very happy to open uh, the key consideration for optimal valve selection sponsored by Medtronic. Uh, we have two uh, distinguished uh, speakers. So I'd like to introduce first speaker. Uh, he's um, Dr. Jeffrey Palmer. So now is, he is working for Medtronic uh, company. So he's, uh, um, I think, uh, the toughest uh, interventional cardiologist. And also, uh, he has a lot of uh, perspective about the, uh, the uh, transcaster valve implantation. So uh, he's going to uh, give us a talk about the evolution of Evolut and the recent clinical update. So Dr. Pama, are you ready? So very yes, good to see I you. Think so. yeah. Good to see you too. Good to see everyone. Although I see you have to wear masks still. So I think in the US, now we have forgotten all about masks, but I appreciate that when we go to meetings, we should probably be wearing masks. So it's good to see everybody. Can you see my slides? Do, are those Yes, you can okay? see very clearly. Okay, great. Okay, good. And, and I should take about 20 minutes, do you think? 20, 25 minutes? We should stop at, at, at 10.25 or 10.30? What, what time do you think? So uh, it depends on you. If you are, uh, oh, I know you're not. Yeah, gonna, if you want to talk a fairly long, we can. Uh, no, we can I don't want to talk long. Yeah, I want to have good discussion, so we can have a good discussion. Listen, it's it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to finish it, you know, about 25 after the hour. We can have good good time for questions in our next speaker. Um, and my real project today is to talk with you about Evolute and where we've really come with our clinical data. As as you as was mentioned, I've spent 20 years in the Harvard system first at the Beth Israel Deaconess, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and then at the Beth Israel Deaconess for the last 10 years or so. And I had the fortune of being able to be the co national co-PI, co-principal investigator, for the core valve and then the Evolute studies. And then about a year and a half ago, I moved uh, to Medtronic as full-time as a chief medical officer for coronary renal innovation and structural heart. And I did look at the rest of your event agenda, it's fabulous for all those aspects uh, of, of interventional cardiology. Things have evolved quite a lot in the last 20 years of TAVI. When it all started, it just started with the sapient balloon expandable and the core valve. And in the years that followed now, we have quite a number of transcatheter valves that have been very effective in releasing suffering in extreme risk patients, in high-risk patients, intermediate-risk patients, and most recently in the U.S. studies for, for low-risk patients, low-surgical-risk patients. So now we have to have excellent results. And those excellent results are required as new valves are being evaluated, but certainly we have to have excellent results for the two most popular balloon expandable and self-expanding valves. Now, I, I think it's everyone knows, but the core valve was invented by the cardiac surgeon, Jacques Sagoon, who wanted to make this a sutureless surgical valve. It's self-expanding nitinol. It's a conformable frame. The, the, the leaflets are super annular. The gradients are low. We've added an external wrap for paravalvid regurgitation. And then the transition occurred where rather than using this as a surgical valve, Dr. Laborde and Dr. Grube and the early inventors of core valve moved it to be a transcatheter valve with all the same features. And it was primarily focused to provide excellent hemodynamic results. And we've shown that over the years. We've shown that out to eight years and, and five years in our pivotal trials and eight year in Notion, 10 years in the UK and, and German series, that the gradients are lower with, uh, with, with self-expanding core valve, 
than they have been with surgical valves and more recently balloon expandable valves. And we certainly understand that. And we understand now that the degree of gradients correlates with the flow across the valve. The more flow across the valve, the higher the gradients. But at least in the United States, all of our heart team meetings revolve around these factors. How durable is the valve? Is there leaflet thrombosis? What about pacemakers? How easy is the valve to use? What about coronary access if the patient has to have a later angiogram? What about TAV in TAV if the valve fills? So we have felt that our focus should be on lifetime management. And I'm gonna show you some very interesting data about how we've addressed all of these factors when understanding how to select the right valve for the patients. But let's start with durability. The European guidelines and the VARC guidelines have both suggested that bioprosthetic valve function relates to four dif different factors, structural valve deterioration, non-structural valve deterioration, thrombosis, and endocarditis. When we look at durability, both on the bench top model with finite element analysis in the upper left and longer term outcomes as we see on the right side of the screen with, with uh, a comparison to surgery for, for hemodynamic and structural valve deterioration, we see that the durability of the self-expanding valve seems to be better with superannular valves compared to surgical valves. So we put all this data together at an ACC late-breaking clinical trials presentation by Dr. Marco, Michael Reardon. And we took the same criteria that were used in the Partner 2A study, intermediate risk patients treated with balloon expandable uh, or, or, sorry, balloon expandable or surgery. And in that study, the five-year rate of structural valve deterioration was 3.9% with sapien, and it was 3.5% with surgery. So the same or slightly higher with balloon expandable. But we evaluated all of our data from the core valve randomized trials for patient at high risk and intermediate surgical risk. And then we added in all the other patients that we treated as part of our studies. The definition that we used for hemodynamic valve deterioration was a change in 10 millimeters of mercury of gradient from the, last, from the discharge echo to the last available echo and a mean gradient of more than 20 millimeters of mercury along with intraprocedural aortic regurgitation. The, we, we evaluated in these two studies, randomized studies, 1,000 patients treated with surgery and 1,000 patients treated with TAVR. And this is what we found. Using the VARC definition of structural valve deterioration, we found that the rate of structural valve deterioration was 4.38% for surgery, and it was nearly half that, or 2.2% with, with, uh, with core valve TAVI. Now, the important part, I think, was that in patients with small annuli, there was a much more dramatic reduction from 5.84 to 1.32. So we didn't see very much structural valve deterioration in patients with small annuli. There were a lot more with surgery. And we think a lot more with balloon expandable as well. Now, the, the, in larger valves, there was still a reduction from 3.99 to 2.50, but it didn't reach clinical significance. So at least for the data that we have seen out to five years, the durability as assessed by structural valve deterioration is better with our superannular valve than it is with an annular valve with surgery. Now, the other important factor that we showed 
that was shown was that if a patient developed structural valve deterioration, they had a twofold increase in mortality. So that means that we have to watch patients very carefully when they do change their gradients and have a high residual gradient of follow-up because it has clinical importance to them with respect to death and rehospitalizations. So we're doing a randomized trial in the United States. We're about 600 patients into the 700 patients that we'll randomize, small annuli, randomized to either Evolute or to Sapien 3, using bioprosthetic valve dysfunction endpoints at one year and five years. Now, a couple of quick points from the surgical literature. This graphic from Dr. Johnson and Dr. Blackstone from the Cleveland Clinic shows that the degree of the residual gradient immediately after the procedure predicts structural valve deterioration for the long term um, after surgical aortic valve replacement. The residual gradients do matter. And on the right side of the screen, we see that it becomes more important the younger the patients are. And in the United States, we're having a, a drift now to the average age of the patients now being down into the 70s, where the residual gradient makes much more difference for the patients for the long term. So, so when we look at how long patients live after their surgical valve replacement, on average, it's about 12 to 13 years. We also think that that's about the time the surgical valve lasts. We think that because our structural valve deterioration rate is half that, that patients who are in their 70s and 80s, and, and particularly mid-80s, will have a lesser chance of needing a second valve if you use the best valve hemodynamically as the first valve. So we think the first valve is very, very important in terms of long-term durability. We could look at other things, which I'll go through quickly, that relate to non-structural valve deterioration. Let me show you a couple pieces. That's PPM and paravalvular regurgitation. We think PPM is still important. Uh, we have very, very low rates with Evolute, as you know. And most importantly, this graph shows that with our optimal implantation technique and the optimized pro study, which has now been expanded out to 400 patients, over 80% of patients have none or trace paravalvular or central regurgitation after the procedure, over 80%. No patients with moderate to severe, the rest of the patients being mild. So that has been a big forward advance for us, improving both our design of our valve and our operating technique. I'll quickly touch on thrombus. We think it's also important. We think that the intraannular valves have higher rates of thrombus formation, valve thrombosis, then superannular valves that comes from meta-analyses and from the partner three trial at two years. So we, we need to think about that with respect to washout from the, from, the, from the vessel. But those are all the good things. We have to import and, and we have to address the other components. Certainly, we have learned with our cusp overlap technique by unforeshortening the left ventricular outflow tract, we can have a more precise placement of our valve. That's been very, very useful to us in terms of having accurate placement of the valve at three millimeters depth. We also think that commissure alignment is extremely important because that will allow subsequent coronary access. And we'll talk about some of the ease of use components in just a second. Our optimized pro-clinical trial prospectively evaluated 400 uh, patients, 8.8% 30-day pacemaker rate, better than the 17.4% we had in our low-risk trial. And in our mandatory TVT registry, which is all patients treated with Evolute in the United States, our in-hospital pacemaker rate has dro dropped down now to 7.5% most recent quarter. So we're doing better with pacemakers. Very, very important. What about ease of use? 
Well, we think that putting the flush port in at three o'clock, discovered by Dr. Gilbert Tang, is very, very important because it'll allow us to have more accurate commissure alignment. We know now from Dr. Giuseppe Tarantini's study in JAK and CERC cardiovascular interventions that if commissure alignment is achieved, then the visualization rate of both the left and the right coronary artery is 97%. Much, much, much better. So commissure alignment is key to us being able to gain coronary access. Let me show you what we're evaluating now in the United States, and I hope we have to get it over to you as fast as we can. It's our next generation. The next generation valve that we have is called FX. It is an improvement compared to Evolute Pro and Evolute Pro Plus by having a better nose cone, a more flexible tip, a single shaft design, a good stability layer, and three inflow markers. And let me show you how FX is going to be an improvement over what we currently have. Firstly, on the right side of the screen, when you start to deploy an Evolute, we all understand that the valve slips forward into the ventricle and we pull back and that cants the valve. The FX has a different layer, stability layer, so that when on the left side, the FX is deployed, it's coaxial and we're not left with a canted valve. Very, very important. And in the first 100 patients that have been treated in the US, very encouraging results. This valve also has three commissural markers. And those markers are three millimeters above the inflow, and they're located right at the commissure. Why do we want to do commissural markers? Because in the cusp overlap technique, we can then position two markers to the left side of the screen and one to the right, and that lines up the neocommissures with the native commissures. Very, very important, we think, for coronary access. And we can visualize that and see it. Again, in the first 100 patients, very successful in achieving commissural alignment. Now, every year, we hope to have a new iteration of valve. That's what our plans are. And so our next generation will be FX plus. And the FX plus will have an open cell where the coronary arteries are. So that with commissure alignment, then the coronaries can be directly accessed. And following that will be FX 360. That will allow us to rotate the catheter at the handle, which will result in rotation at the inflow when the catheter's in the ascending aorta. We can't do that now. And that's gonna allow us to do both commissure alignment and coronary alignment, because we can go to a cusp overlap view that shows coronary overlap and be able to line up our markers in this fashion. So those are our next generations of valves. We're also coming up with a wire that's similar to a Lundquist stiffness with a double curve. Uh, and that will allow us then to be able to have good positioning of the Evolute Pro Plus and FX during deployment, which will help with stability and be safe in the ventricle, particularly in smaller um, Asian patients. So the last thing I'll just touch on very briefly is when we have to treat an Evolute failure. And we believe in those circumstances that most often a balloon expandable sapien inside the Evolute is the best bet because what it allow us to do as we plan these cases is to go ahead and access the coronary arteries. But we are working on some other advanced leaflet management techniques as well, such as basilica and those things that you used in your practice when needs be for narrow sinuses. So I think I'm gonna stop there um, because I wanna make sure that the, we can get our next um, talk in and we have time for discussion. But I've shown you where we think the evidence base is right now for why the valve selection should really emphasize which is the best valve for the first implant. And we've talked about why durability has been different with superannual valves compared to surgery, and we'll see compared to balloon expandable in the SMART trial. 
We already know that because of the construct of the valve that leads to thrombosis may be less. And we're approaching all the other components, ease of use, pacemakers, coronary access, and, and management strategies for tab and tab. So that if these things arise, we can actually address them uh, with an effective treatment to preserve coronary access for patients. So let's, let me stop there. Maybe we can go to the next lecture and then maybe we can have some discussion afterwards. And I wanna really thank you uh, for your attention this morning. Um, we're excited about where we're gonna go with our program with the evidence base. And I think it's gonna be very important for us to be able to learn from you, particularly in the bicuspid world, about which, which of these best valves uh, we should be using for, for our patients. So thanks so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for your nice lecture. And also, uh, uh, thank you for sharing the uh, maturing pipeline and the future uh, uh, items. And then I think uh, uh, we will have a discussion time uh, at the end of the, this session. So uh, maybe next speaker will be introduced by uh, Dr. Che. Yes. <clears throat> The next speaker is uh, In Suk Kang from Iwa University Hospital, Mokdong. He she is working very hard at that hospital. So the topic is recently evidence and the implication to real world practice. Would you please? 한국말로 준비해서 한국말로 <laughs> 발표하도록 하겠습니다. 네. 네. 소개 말씀 감사합니다. 이렇게. 좋은 자리에서 발표할 수 있도록 기회를 주셔서 감사합니다. 제가 오늘 말씀드릴 내용은 올 초에 어, 국제학회에서 소개되었던 연구 결과를 간략하게 요약해 드리고 저의 부족하지만 짧은 경험을 여러 선생님들과 나누고자 합니다. 비게너 레벨에서 쉽게 접근할 수 있을 정도의 케이스로 준비해 보았습니다. 먼저 말씀드릴 내용은 어, 허습 오버랩 테크닉의 최근 결과를 어, 발표되었던 옵티마이즈 프로 스터디에 대해서 간략하게 말씀을 드리겠습니다. 올 초에 결과가 발표가 되었고 이 연구는 어, 셀프 익스팬더블 밸브인 에볼루트 밸브를 어, 삽입함에 있어서 어, 허습 오버랩 테크닉을 표준화하여서 사용했을 때 어떠한 이점이 있었는지를 보고자 하는 연구였고요. 앞에 연자가 간략하게 말씀드린 바와 같습니다. 잘 아시는 바와 같이 커스브 오버랩 테크닉은 NCC를 이렇게 잘 구별함으로써 컨덕션 시스템과의 그 접촉을 최소화하여서 어, 추후에 퍼머넌트 페이스메이커의 삽입을 최소화할 수 있도록 하는 방법입니다. 이 연구는 현재 인로를 계속하고 있는 상황이고요. 메인 코어트 400명 정도에서 총 504명이 인롤된 상태입니다. 어, 결과는 뭐, 이 대부분의 환자가 에볼로트 프로를 넣었고, 뎁스, NCC의 뎁스는 3mm 뎁스로 잘 임플란테이션 되었고, 굉장히 좋은 결과를 보여주었습니다. 그래서 메인 코어트의 퍼머넌트 페이스메이커 삽입이 9.8%, 총 화폐선은 9.2%, 를 보고하였습니다. 그래서 이 옵티마이즈 프로는 지금까지는 30대의 리절트만 나와 있긴 하지만 어, 그 30대의 그 퍼머넌트 페이스메이커 9.2% 싱글 디지트였고 파라벡툴라 리퀴지가 시비어 모더레이트는 0%였고 다음날 퇴원이 가능하였다는 그런 좋은 결과를 보여주었습니다. 커스 오버랩 테크닉에 대해서 이게 이제 퍼머넌트 페이스메이커 삽입을 줄일 수 있기 때문에 중요한 어, 좋은 테크닉이라고 생각이 듭니다. 먼저 커스 오버랩 프로젝션을 결정을 하고 어, 그거에 따라서 어, 그 컨덕션 시스템과의 컨택을 최소화하면서 어, 그렇게 하기 위해서 픽테일을 NCC에 위치하고 미드 포션에 이렇게 마커밴드를 위치시키면서 천천히 릴리즈 하는 방식입니다. 릴리즈 하면서 자연스럽게 밸브가 아래쪽으로 내려오게 됩니다. 하지만 모든 환자에서 이렇게 이제 밸브가 잘 내려오는 건 아니고 환자에 따라 조금 차이가 있었기 때문에 경험이 좀 필요할 것 같습니다. 그리고 이제 3개 정도 노브가 나왔을 때 왔다 갔다 하면서 마이그레이션 하려는 경향이 있기 때문에 이것도 이제 시술자와 뭐 환자의 경향에 따라서 다를 수 있겠지만 페이싱을 
아주 라피티 페이싱까지 아니어도 120에서 150회 정도 하면서 밸브를 디플로이 할 수도 있겠습니다. 앵글을 돌려서 다른 각도에서 어, 밸브의 뎁스를 최종 평가하고 마지막으로 필요하다면 뭐 리캡처를 할 수도 있고 그렇습니다. 그래서 앵글을 돌려서 이렇게 이제 각도를 측정을 하시고 그 다음에 필요하다면 은 리캡처를 뭐할 수도 있겠습니다. 너무 쉘로우하거나 너무 깊은 경우 이제 쉘로우하면 은 밸브가 마이그레이션이 될 수가 있고 너무 깊은 경우에는 또 마이트라이 밸브와의 간섭이나 또 페이스메이커 삽입을 해야 되는 경우가 늘어날 수 있기 때문에 맞춰서 시행하시면 되겠고 우리가 밸브를 마지막으로 릴리즈하기 전에 그 시스템 자체를 텐전을 줄이기 위해서 센트럴리제이션을 좀 하기 위해서 딜리버리 시스템 자체를 포워드 프레셔를 좀 주고 와이어를 좀 띄워서 노즈콘을 좀 프리하게 텐전의 최소화한 상태에서 천천히 포워드 프레셔를 이렇게 줘가면서 릴리즈하게 되겠습니다. 그래서 음, 여러 선생님들 다 잘하고 계시겠지만 몇 가지 예를 준비해 보았습니다. 어, 여기서 이제 권고하기로는 뭐 런더키스트 같은 스티프 와이어를 사용하는 걸 권고하고 있긴 하지만 저는 개인적으로는 런더키스트는 거의 쓰지 않고 사파리나 어, 컴퓨터 와이어를 사용하고 있습니다. 이 밸브가 들어가면서 픽테일이 약간 올라가긴 했지만 픽테일이 NCC 하단에 딱 맞게 있다고 가정했을 때 미드 포션에 해당되는 부위에 마커 밴드를 위치하고 천천히 어, 밸브를 릴리즈 하고 있는 장면입니다. 세개 정도 나왔을 때 왔다 갔다 할수 있기 때문에 안정화 시키기 위해서 라피드 페이싱을 할 수도 있지만 이 환자는 비교적 그냥 와이어랑 그 델리버리 카테터의 컨트롤로 잘 어, 릴리즈 할수 있었고 앵글을 돌려서 보았을 때도 3mm 뎁스로 잘 맞았던 어, 잘 맞아서 센트럴리제이션을 하고 와이어의 텐전을 좀 풀어서 천천히 릴리즈를 해서 좋은 결과를 얻었던 케이스입니다. 이게 이제 가장 대표적으로 그냥 일반적으로 권고 상황에 따라서 잘 되었던 케이스고요. 그 다음에 이제 이 환자 같은 경우는 이제 어 천천히 풀면서 밸브가 밑으로 잘 내려왔습니다. 일반적인 이제 비에이버를 잘 보였는데 에뉴라 컨택이 어 되기 시작하면 하고 있는 상황인데요. 밸브가 그렇게 뭐 불안정해 보이지 않았고 오히려 3mm 뎁스로 좀더 깊은 것 같이 이렇게 생각되고 있었는데 갑자기 컨택 이후에 퍽하고 이렇게 벨 쉐입으로 커지면서 위로 마이그레이션 했던 케이스입니다. 이런 경우는 사실은 이미 애뉴라 컨택이 돼, 돼서 프레셔는 떨어진 이후에 이렇게 위로 튀어 올라간 거라서 페이싱을 한다고 해서 크게 좋을 것 같지는 않고 그래서 미드 포션보다는 이런 경우에는 좀더 아래에서 이 밸브의 특성과 환자의 뭐, 뭐 구조적인 문제와 관련이 있을 것 같은데요. 좀더 아래에서 천천히 이렇게 디플로이 하면 어, 위치를 잡는 데는 큰 무리가 없을 것으로 생각이 듭니다. 어, 다음 환자는 이제 80세 여자 환자분이셨고요. 비슷하게 이제 또 커스 모보랩 테크닉을 해서 밸브를 풀고 있는데 이 환자는 풀면서 계속 그 에올타 쪽으로 마이그레이션을 계속해서 한두번 정도 리캡처를 하였고 이렇게 이제 좀더 아래에서 풀기 천천히 풀기 시작했던 경우입니다. 이런 경우 사실은 뭐 여러 선생님들 많이 경험하실 걸로 생각이 듭니다. 밑으로 내려오는 경우도 있지만 위로 마이그레이션 하는 경우도 있어서 이런 경우에는 뭐 페이싱을 조금 더 적극적으로 하는 것이 좋을 것으로 생각이 됩니다. 그래서 이 환자는 이렇게 이제 천천히 나오면서 위치는 레벨은 뭐 3mm 뎁스 잘 맞고 있고요. 그래서 두세 개의 노브, 노드가 나왔을 때부터 좀 조기에 페이싱을 조금 계속했던 경우입니다. 페이싱을 하는데도 이제 조금 약간 언스테이블한 양상이어서 와이어랑 델리버리 카테터로 힘을 조절해 가면서 충분히 풀어서 런 리캡처 존이 어느 정도 안정될 때까지 상당히 페이싱을 하면서 어, 밸브를 위치시켰던 경우가 되겠습니다. 그래서 파라렉스를 맞게 다른 앵글에서도 다 확인을 하고 릴리즈를 해서 좋은 결과를 얻었던 경우고요. 커스 모보랩 뷰에서 마지막으로 소개하는 증례인데요. 이 익스트림한 케이스 70도 이상에서는 사실은 이 밸브 시스템을 잘 권하지는 않는데 이분은 이제 이 밸브를 디플로이했던 경우입니다. 
에올타 자체가 거의 90도 가까이 누워 있기 때문에 음, 아무래도 유한자 같은 경우에는 그 디플로이 하면서 밑으로 내려가는 게 조금 적을 걸로 예상을 해서 거의 그 커습에 맞추어서 이렇게 조금 아래에다가 두고 릴리즈를 시도했습니다. 그리고 이제 어느 정도 풀었는데 그 이분이 워낙 심장이 누워 있다 보니까 커습 오버랩 뷰가 이제 니어 커습 오버랩 뷰로 했는데 거의 카우다리 35도, LA 20도까지 앵글이 많이 심한 경우였고 오히려 이제 다른 앵글로 봤을 때 NCC가 더 이렇게 좀더 안정적으로 보이고 어, 커스 오버랩 뷰에서는 1에서 한 3mm 왔다 갔다 굉장히 쉘로우해 보였지만 다른 앵글에서 좀 괜찮아 보였기 때문에 이렇게 이제 릴리즈를 하고 어, AR이 조금 있긴 하지만 전반적으로 이렇게 뎁스랑 모든 면에서 만족스러웠던 경우입니다. 그래서 커스 오버랩 테크닉을 뭐 여러 시츄에이션과 환자의 비에이비어가 다양할 수는 있지만 어, 임상적으로 사용하는 데 있어서는 큰 무리가 없고 이걸 통해서 어, 페이스메이커 인서션 하는 레이스를 많이 줄일 수 있는 도움이 많이 되는 테크닉이라고 생각이 됩니다. 그 외에 몇 가지 어, 케이스들이 더 발표되었는데요. 트라이얼들이 더 발표되었는데 잠깐 소개해드리면 은그 페리카디아 랩이 있는 그 시스템을 가지고 했었을 때 3년 아웃컴에 대한 결과가 발표되었습니다. 포워드 프로 스터디인데요. 629명의 환자를 대상으로 연구하였고 평균 81세 정도였습니다. 이 환자들의 3년 아웃컴을 보면 은 EOA가 잘 유지되고 좋은 헤모다이나믹 아웃컴을 보여주었고 인상적인 것은 시간이 지나면서 12어 AR이 점점 감소하는 어, 그런 좋은 결과를 보여주었습니다. 좀 페이스메이커 인서션 레이스는 조금 상당히 높은 그런 결과를 보여주었는데 어, 포워드 프로 스터디의 결과는 그 페리카디아 랩 시스템을 적용했을 때 페어러블하고 헤머다이내믹 아웃컴이 좋았다는 것이고 좀 인상적인 것은 시간이 지나면서 이 밸브가 셀프 익스팬더블 밸브이기도 하고 또 랩으로 쌓여있기 때문에 어, 시간이 지나면서 그 파라벨블라 리키지에 대한 좀더 긍정적인 결과를 보고하기도 하였습니다. 그 외에 몇 가지 좀 흥미로운 결과가 두 가지가 있어서 더 말씀을 드리면 여성에서 12어 어, 페이션트 프로스테시스 디스매치가 있는 것은 잘 알려진 바가 있습니다. 이 이제 썰탑이랑 어, 에볼루트 로우 리스크 RCT 풀드 아날리스한 900명 정도 여성을 대상으로 한 연구에서 12어 PPM이 6.2%로 남성의 4.1%에 비해서 여성에게 높다는 것이고요. PPM은 잘 아시다시피 환자의 바디 사이즈에 비해서 프로스테시스의 이펙티브 오리스피스 에어리아가 너무 작아서 생기는 문제이고 어부노만한 하이 포스트 오퍼러티브 그레디언트가 발생하는 것입니다. 여성이 가장 어, 스트롱 크리니컬 프리딕터이고 스몰러 애닐러스 에어리어를 가진 여성에서 특히 그렇습니다. 다른 동반된 리스크 팩터들이 있지만 이 PPM 자체가 환자의 어떤 어드버즈 아웃컴 자체의 어떤 직접적인 원인이라기보다는 세로게이트 마커로 생각이 되고 있습니다. 그리고 이제 바디 서페이스 에어리아로 나눠준 인덱스드 EOA가 중요하다고 생각이 되고 12어 PPM은 0.65 이하인 경우를 정의를 하고 있고 오벤스한 환자에 있어서는 좀더 프레셔가 걸리는 경향이 있기 때문에 0.55로 정의하고 있습니다. 다른 원인들을 배제하고서 진단해야 됩니다. 그래서 여성에서의 PPM, 12어 PPM이 어떤 의미가 있냐 이런 서브그룹 아날리시스를 했을 때 컴포지트 엔드포인트의 아웃컴이 2년 동안 차이는 없었지만 어, 스트로크가 더 많았다라는 조금 인상적인 결과를 보고하였습니다. 그리고 이제 파트너스리 트라이얼에서도 서브그룹 아날리시스를 했을 때 여기서는 이제 여성, 시비어 PPM을 가진 여성이 남성과 달리 아웃컴이 나빴다 뭐 이런 거를 보고하기도 하였습니다. 하지만 시비어 PPM 자체가 아웃컴이 안 좋은 것은 사실이지만 남상, 남성은 괜찮고 여성만 나쁜 것이냐에 대한 문제는 좀더 연구가 필요할 것으로 생각이 됩니다. 그 크리니컬 트라이얼의 서브그룹 아날리시스에 대한 해석은 조금 주의가 필요할 것으로 생각이 되고 좀더 롱텀 아웃컴을 봐야 될 것으로 생각이 됩니다. 그리고 이제 
서전들 입장에서는 그 PPM과 관련돼서 스초리스 밸브를 대안으로 많이 생각하는 것 같습니다. 스초리스 밸브는 오퍼레이션 타임이 좀 짧고 꼬매지 않기 때문에 아무래도 PPM이 좀덜올수 있겠다라는 생각이 들긴 하지만 여, 여전히 마찬가지로 스초리스 밸브도 어, 컨덕션 디소더로부터 자유로울 수 없고 파라베블라 리키지 이슈가 있기 때문에 또한 연구 데이터도 많지 않기 때문에 이것은 해석하는 데좀 주의가 필요할 것 같습니다. 그래서 PPM과 관련돼서 타비가 여러 연구 결과를 이렇게 관통하면서 어, 사바보다는 확실히 덜 생기는 것으로 결론이 계속 나오고 있습니다. 셀프 익스팬딩이건 벌론 익스팬딩이건 간에 사바보다는 확실히 그 레이시 더 적은 것으로 되어 있습니다. 그리고 특별히 에블로트 시스템 같은 경우는 스프라 에눌라 디자인이기 때문에 좀더 유리하다고 할수 있겠습니다. 그 다음에 이제 마지막으로 가져온 연구 결과는 앵귤레이션과 관련된 이슈입니다. 상당히 재밌는 결과라고 생각이 듭니다. 앵귤레이션, 에올틱 루트 앵귤레이션에 따라서 환자의 해모 다이나믹이나 아웃컴이 달라질 것인가를 본 것인데요. 40도, 뭐 60도 이상 이렇게 살펴본 것인데 제가 받은 이 데이터상에서는 60도 이상이 얼마나 앵귤이 심한지에 대한 평균치는 없어서 잘알 수는 없었지만 어찌됐든 2년간의 아웃컴을 볼때 해모 다이나믹이나 어떤 올코즈 모탈리티, 디세이블 스트로크는 차이가 없었습니다. 그래서 굉장히 어, 긍정적인 결과라고 생각이 듭니다. 앞에서 보여드렸던 이 환자 케이스를 다시 보여드리면 이 환자는 앵귤이 86도였고 여기 이제 LVOT에 칼슘이 있었기 때문에 어, 에볼루트 밸브를 사실은 좀더 선택했던 그런 케이스입니다. 그리고 밸브를 디플로이 하고 나서 이제 엑스레이를 찍었을 때 이렇게 밸브가 거의 누워있는 하일리 앵귤레이션 되어 있는 환자였습니다. 이런 경우에 사실은 시술적으로 어려울 수는 있지만 이 연구 결과를 볼때 2년까지 아웃컴에서 크게 차이가 없을 걸로 사실 기대가 되고 이 환자가 이제 시술한 지 7개월 되었는데 아웃컴이 아직까지 괜찮습니다. 중간에 뭐 이벤트가 있고 전신 상태 나빠지고 하면서 LV 펑션이 좀 나빠지긴 했지만 회복되고 있습니다. 그래서 결론을 말씀드리면 은 커습 오버랩 테크닉을 사용했을 때 어, 퍼머넌트 페이스메이커 삽입을 줄일 수 있고 싱글 디지트 페이스메이커 삽입 유부를 보였기 때문에 더 적극적으로 이렇게 고려할 수 있겠다라는 것이고 페리카디아 랩을 적용했을 때 히모다이나믹하고 크리닉카 아웃컴을 개선시킬 수 있다. 그 다음에 슈플라 에눌라 디자인의 밸브가 특별히 이제 시비어 ppm 체구가 작은 여성 환자에 있어서 유리할 수 있겠다라는 것이고 에올틱 앵귤과는 크리닉카 아웃컴은 크게 상관이 없었다. 이렇게 어, 말씀드리겠습니다. 이상입니다. 네, 감사합니다. Thank you. Thank you for your nice lecture and sharing your uh, successful cases uh, uh, with Tabel. So uh, we have uh, three uh, uh, panelists here. And the Professor Kang In-suk, he is uh, also the speaker uh, in the last lecture. And then Ju-hyun Kim, uh, working for uh, Korea University, and hyun Ong Park, working for uh, Chungnam uh, university hospital. So, um, is there any comment or question from the panels? Yes. Professor Park? Yep. Mm. I have a question to Jeff. Thank you for your good lecture. Uh, you showed the uh, uh, new version Evolute effects. So, there are so many advantages compared to previous. Uh, device. So is there any uh, change of uh, the device, uh, device profile for vascular access? That's an excellent question. And first of all, I want to, I, I loved that last lecture because I, I felt that we, we've worked very hard within Medtronic to provide evidence of the value of what we're doing. And I, I just, I think you did a very, very nice job summarizing all of the important information and the themes that we're trying to move forward. I just, I just loved it, it was great. Now with respect to FX, there's not a difference in the profile. 
but there is a difference in the nose cone. So the nose cone now is like a dilator, like a sheath dilator, very smooth, so that you won't feel any resistance when you're entering into the common femoral that we may have felt with the older system. It's very atraumatic, very atraumatic for the tip. Now, one of the things that we're working on, and I would wonder if you would find it valuable, is an expandable sheath. One of the advantages of Evolute Pro Plus has been its low profile, 14 French equivalent for the new generations. And that's lower, that's the lowest of all the ones for the 23, 26, and 29. It's a little bit bigger for the 34. But we, we, we are in the process of trying to develop an expandable sheath that could be as low as 10 to 11 French. And then it would be just like with the blue expandable valve, the expandable sheath goes in, then the valve goes in, and then you do the procedure and leave the sheath in for the pre-dill and for the post-dill, if you need to, and then remove everything at the end. So I'll ask you, would you find an expandable sheath worthwhile in your practice, or do you like the very low profile of the, of the Evolute? What do you think? So Dr. what do you think about the- I would rather, I would rather prefer low profile device. Okay. And we have, we'll have that, yeah. So, so, so this, the, the FX will be low profile. I, I don't think we can make it any smaller, mm -hmm. but it will maintain with all the added features that low profile plus add in the, um, the added advantage of, um, of not having any trauma with the dilator as it moves up, dilator like for the nose cone. Yes, uh, it's very important because of uh, the delivery system, the profile become uh, slender and slender. The, it uh, have uh, some damage for scaffolding power of the Dava system. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I think um, uh, we can negotiate the uh, scaffolding power and then uh, the profile of the delivery system. So yeah. I have a question about the, um, the durability of the valve because uh, uh, now we are treating the younger patient more and more. I think uh, in the future, we will have a lot of patients with uh, uh, age under 75, something. So um, the durability issue is very important. So it, you uh, already show the durability of the, um, uh, the uh, self-expandable valve system. So, uh, so one of the uh, issue is uh, structural valve deterioration. So I think um, um, the... Uh, SVD uh, in the cyber system is a 3.5 something in, in the five years. And uh, the, especially you, you show the small annular, small annulus, uh, uh, patient having small annuli uh, has a very, um, uh, I mean, the very big difference between the self expandable valve and cyber system. What, what, what it make a uh, very big difference uh, so because of the suburb uh, is uh, um, the small annuli there uh, might be a higher chance of a PPM so is there any other explanation about the big difference yeah, in the, yeah. I, I think it relates to the differences in the residual gradients because when we go down to smaller annuli whether it's a balloon expandable valve or a surgical valve when we're in the annular diameters of 23 or less, that's where we did our cutoff, the differences in the gradients can be four to six millimeters in mer millimeters of mercury, and it's probably three to four millimeters in the larger valves. So I think that that gradient differential makes a big difference. But I think that you've touched a very important point, which is that, um, that, that with surgery, the, the residual gradients are determined a little bit by what the surgical valve size is. So most of the valve, surgical valve size were 19 and 21, some 23s in the smaller annuli. And that's what the surgeons already know 
that they try to put larger valves in. So we're doing more root enlargement procedures now in the US and trying to put larger surgical valves in because it's something about getting the gradients as low as possible in that small annualized subset. And I'd ask maybe for you, because we need to learn more, are most of your patients having smaller annuli where the valves that you need are in the 23, 26, 29 evolute range? Is, is that what you find in Korea? Not so small. I, I think that the, the Korean patient is not so, not so small, uh, have some mid-range or generalized. Mid-range, yeah. I have, yeah. I have some questions. So, do you have any data on the durability issue regarding the bicuspid aortic patient? We don't. We don't. Um, just one year data so far. Um, our limitation in the US studies is that bicuspid disease is relatively uncommon. It's probably less than 10% of our patients and even more uncommon are Seaver zeros. So, so we do need to have some longer term durability study in bicuspid patients from your teams in the Asia Pacific theater where the prevalence of bicuspid is so much greater. So we do have one year data. We're following all the patients longer, but right now we've only reported one year. Things look fine to one year, but we've not reported the, the structural valve deterioration rate in bicuspid disease yet. We have no reason to think it's not gonna be good because I think a lot of it's by gradients, but I think the lifetime management becomes much more um, challenging in younger patients with bicuspid disease. And we need to start sorting those things out. But we'll learn from, from your teams in, in the Asia Pacific. Okay, uh, we need more data about the uh, bicuspid disease. And then uh, some surgeons uh, um, have a, a question about the uh, durability regarding the uh, tissue valve used in the, uh, the, in the system. So is a porcine or bovine, uh, is there any difference between uh, uh, regarding in terms of uh, the durability of the tissue, tissue yeah. valve? So, so the Edwards studies use just Edwards valves. Our studies mostly used Edwards valves, but allowed the, 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 the physicians to make other choices about other valves. So there's some mosaic. There's a few uh, trifecta, there's not very many mitral flow. But we found the biggest determinant of SVD in the surgical patients, even more than the valve type used, was, was using a smaller valve, using a 19 or 21 compared to a 23, 25. That, that, that was what was driving the higher rates of structural valve deterioration. We will continue to follow patients for the long term when we use the precise definition, the precise one as written in VARC with our data and using the numbers for partner 2A that I showed earlier, the numeric rate is, is just a little bit lower with our core valve studies than with surgery using the exact criteria. But it's not a head-to-head -head trial, so we don't know. But we do think that ultimately valve type will be important, but more importantly, not putting small valves in is going to be the biggest determinant for better surgery in the future. And of course, all the companies now are working on better valve leaflet material that has better durability. And, and that, that will certainly be one of the answers in the future. Yes, and, and a final question about the durability of the, uh, uh, the tower system. Because uh, uh, from the notion eight years data, uh, there is a big difference between the uh, Saber and Tower system uh, in terms of uh, structural uh, valve deterioration. But uh, the summation of non-SVD, uh, uh, the, the uh, difference was a uh, uh, radical one. So um, uh, I think uh, uh, it's uh, non-inferior 
to the server is the, uh, the important thing or uh, if we uh, think about the non-SVD is the, uh, the huddle, uh, something huddle for the durability issue. So what yeah. do you think about non-SVD? Yeah. yeah. So, so the early core valve and our core valve as well, the non-structural valve deterioration by the VARC criteria has two factors. It has PPM, and that falls in favor of the core valve device. And it has significant paravalvular regurgitation, and that goes against the core valve system compared to surgery. So those balance out. The, the other component for bioprosthetic valve dysfunction is thrombus. And I think from our data so far, numerically it's lower, but it's not statistically lower than surgery with our valve. So I think that the reason that Dr. Sundergaard's paper showed non-inferiority, didn't show a betterment for core valve was because the numbers got small. Numerically, there was a 30% reduction, but the numbers were small, 10 and seven, I think. But, but, they, but the, the other components that went into the totality of bioprosthetic valve failure really were the PPM, which calls in favor of, the, of ours, and paravalvular regurgitation. In the recent data, we've certainly done better now with paravalvular regurgitation than in 2010 when the study started, where there was 15% rates of moderate to severe. So I do think that it's gonna be a little bit of a balancing act, and we do need to think of the totality. I think when, that's why in our SMART trial, we're using the totality of bioprosthetic valve dysfunction, which will include SVD, PPM, paravalvular regurgitation, and thrombus. So, so in our SMART trial, randomized, balloon expandable, we'll have all the components that you described. Okay, and, and any comments? So I think um, I have a, a, a question about the FX system. Uh, it is uh, um, the coaxial deployment is uh, our best option, uh, our best uh, advancement of this system. I think um, um, so, uh, coaxial deployment is uh, uh, very important to locate the distal end of the valve in the, uh, uh, the desirable or optimal uh, location. But um, if the uh, aorto uh, uh, LVOT angle is very stiff, uh, more than 60 degrees something, is it uh, still uh, working in, in that kind of horizontal heart? And the second question is, uh, uh, if we are using uh, this kind of coaxial deployment system, uh, it uh, can be reduced, the popping up of the, uh, uh, the valve during the deployment. So, yeah. Yeah. so those are, look, I'm old enough that I remember when all these new valve generations were available everywhere in the world except for the United States. And, and that was the way it used to be. And so our FDA now has made a much more streamlined pathway. So we're seeing many of these devices first in the US and then disseminated out to the rest of the world. We have to get as fast as possible an approval of FX for, for, for Korea so that you can actually give us your own impressions when it becomes an approved device and available. We have FDA approval in the United States. And so the first hundred cases, we've really starting to get a good idea of how it handles. And most of our early implanters took the Ferrari and went on the Grand Prix course and took it everywhere hard cases, tortuosity, horizontal aortas. What the consistent feedback from our US physicians, Dr. Puri, Dr. Adazani, Dr. Gada, Dr. Chikuti, is that the situation you described of a very horizontal aorta is better treated now with FX than it was with Evolute because of the, because of the coaxial. And secondly, when the tabs are released, there's less tension to cause that movement that may relate in a pop-out. 
So I think that having this, this stability layer and less tension in the system, one spine, not two, is gonna to add to a better deployment. We are 100 cases in, in the United States, 100. So we're just getting started. And we'll keep track every single week as we start to get gain our experience better. But I think it will make a difference. And the most important focus for us is to make sure we can get it in your hands as fast as possible through the regulatory authorities. Okay, I have a question to uh, Professor Kang. Yeah. <laughs> so after uh, you're uh, introducing the cost overlap technique in uh, during the uh, Tava system deployment, so how can you reduce? How could you reduce the uh, rate of permanent pacemaker implantation? Is there any some data for your uh, daily uh, practice? Uh, even though I um, not statistically analysis uh, my data, but uh, cost of overhead view provide me some uh, faith about the depth of the uh, valve depth, and it make me more comfortable and no need to uh, manipulate the valve level. If I start the center of the pig tail head, and sometimes, as I previously showed the cases, sometimes uh, there are some variation, the level of the starting uh, deployment level, but uh, I feel uh, it may, it gives me many helpful to uh, reduce the uh, permanent pacemaker implantation, even though I sometimes uh, experience the LBBB after the procedure. I have one more question. So you have shown that the, the old lady, eight, eight, five year old female, she have the annulus angle over around 85 degree? Yes. So how can you bravely choose the self-suspending transfemoral IFU criteria is 70 degrees? Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, because uh, she have chunk of calcium in LCC and also the calcium expanded the LVOT. So I'm worried about the rupture if I use the valve, balloon expanding valve. Yeah, so quite reasonable. So um, the, uh, the final uh, question to Jeff. Yeah, as uh, you uh, uh, nicely explained the uh, the cusp uh, alignment uh, regarding the coronary ostium. So, so if we uh, are using the future system, uh, we can easily uh, align the valve uh, to the uh, coronary ostium. But uh, the previous one. Uh, we cannot uh, see which orientation is uh, yeah. aligned. So if we are using the tower in tower, especially yourself in self, so how can you uh, uh, orient? Uh, how can I uh, uh, the check out the uh, orientation and the cusp alignment? Yeah, uh, it's an excellent question. Um, and that's why we put FX markers on the FX, I mean, quite frankly. So the hat marker, in the LEO projection to the left side of the screen is, is a good indication. And then in the cusp overlap, center front is, is, is good. That's what we're seeing. Putting the flush port in at three o'clock, over 80% of the time takes the catheter to the right place. But, but that's why we're close with the situation that you've described, but we're not perfect with the Evolute Pro or Pro Plus. What we need to do, that's why we have to get the markers on FX so you can see exactly where it is. So that's why the iteration step came around. But right now we're using the hat marker and the flush port. Okay, is there another question or comment from the panel? Yeah. yeah I have one more question, Jeff. <coughs> you may have performed the type of procedure more than uh, <coughs> several hundred. 
Yeah, yeah. So. more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lot. Yeah. Uh, do you have any cut point AEG for Tarby or Tarby or Sarpa? Do you have? Do we have any cut points for age? AEG. For age, yeah. um, our yeah. guidelines, our guidelines for the U.S., which we follow in our clinical practices suggest that patients under 65 years old that are otherwise healthy should have surgery. 65 to 80, it's a heart team discussion. And patients who are over 80 should generally get TAVR. The European guidelines increase that age to 75. 75 and less for surgery, and then over 75 for TAVR. I think that what we do is we try to measure the risks and the benefits of both. And I would say that if there's a younger patient, 65, and they're low risk for surgery, but they're high risk for TAVI, bicuspid, calcified RAFI, very calcified leaflets, probably that patient should go to surgery because they're low risk for surgery and the surgeons will remove all the calcification put a circular valve in as big as possible. And, and even though we could do TAVR by our guidelines, if it's a high risk case for TAVR, then we will want to make sure that we get the patient to the right therapy. So the age I think is a cutoff that is, is fluid. It's based on a discussion with the patients, at least in the United States about the risk benefits, but we have to think about both the surgical risk and the TAVR risk for both extremes to make the right patient. In the US, usually 65 to 80 is a heart team discussion, and then the patients usually end up having TAVR. Okay. Um, what is your average age? What is your average age in Korea? Did you say it's getting down to 70 years old now? Average uh, age for patients in, in Korea? In Korea? So, um... Uh, it's uh, uh, late in the 70s. Yeah, late 70s, yeah, yeah. okay. But coming down, I'd say, yeah. So I, I believe we all have a lot of uh, points uh, to discuss with, uh, but uh, uh, the time's up. So uh, I especially thank you for the uh, Dr. Palmer to join us. Oh, thank uh, you. Uh, thank give you. Us a, a great lecture. And then uh, I think uh, I'm... I uh, always thank you to the Professor Kang and panelists to uh, uh, yeah, joining uh, this session. So I'd like to close this session. Uh, I hope we will uh, see face-to-face uh, -face in, in the near future. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'd like to uh, close this session. Thank you very much. Thank you.